um, I'm also a massive hypocrite because I've just spent 23 years in the events industry convincing thousands of other people to speak. Um, but this is the first time I'm actually putting my money where my mouth is and doing it myself. So um, I'm very, very nervous. Please be gentle. At the end of 2019, I looked like the picture of success. I had a beautiful family, a successful career, a big house, a pretty flash car. Life looked good. In theory, I'd done everything that was expected of a good Asian girl. But despite everything I'd achieved, I felt a sense of emptiness. I was quite frankly bloody knackered after what felt like a lifetime of putting everyone and everything else first. You see, by then, I'd spent many years becoming a card-carrying people pleaser. I put everyone else first. I'd please my parents, I'd please my family, I'd please my husband, I'd please my bosses, I'd please everyone. But I hadn't pleased myself. I realised that I'd become quite performative in how I was living my life. It's a term coined by the sports psychologist Pippa Grange. She talks about kind of just sort of rolling through life, just performing at life, kind of rolling from one thing to the next without really thinking. And I'd, I'd done sort of two decades in the events industry by then. So that was completely cemented into me, just kind of rolling from one target to the next target, even bigger, target, rinse, repeat, target, rinse, repeat, bloody knackering. A few weeks before my 43rd birthday, I realised something was wrong, but I couldn't quite figure out what it was. On paper, I had everything that I was taught I, I should want. I had the big house, I had the career, I had the family. I probably should have said that in the other order, actually, that doesn't make me sound very nice. <laughs> but I had everything that you're supposed to want. But I felt empty, and I felt stuck. There was no rainbow's end. It was like I was stuck on an infinity loop of more, bigger, better. I think that was the start of my unravelling. And then obviously a couple of months later, we're into lockdown, and so we all had quite a lot of time on our hands then, didn't we? Um, and that was when I started um, reading even more, reading loads, um, and I came across Johan Hari's Lost Connections. And... Um, a match was lit, something inside me just sparked, and I started questioning absolutely everything. I was probably quite irritating to be around at that point, because I was just like, oh, and this, and this, and this. Um, my unravelling, as I now call it, um, it forced me to throw out everything I thought I knew about myself, um, and it continued and continued and continued. Over time, I felt more and more disconnected from my work. I loved the people. I, I loved what I did, but it just lacked meaning. Um, and I realised that I wanted to focus more and more on what mattered to me, people and planet. It was a conversation with my then 12-year-old daughter that completely stopped me in my tracks. She said, Mum, do you think I'll be able to have kids, or will that not happen for me because of the climate crisis? I just, it just threw me. How are we living in a world where my 12-year-old daughter is even thinking this? It's, it, was, it just blew my mind. Um, so at the end of last year, I finally plucked up the courage to leave my secure, well-paid job um, and to see what was possible when I stopped people-pleasing um, and started putting myself first. It was the start of doing new things, doing hard things, like coming here and doing this. Um, and it was the start of me trying to move into the climate space as well. After you know, talking to my daughter, I really need, I knew I needed to do something more meaningful than pack thousands of people into convention centres. Thrilling as that was. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. But I got stuck. Um, it's like I thought, I've done the hard bit, but the hard bit was leaving the secure, well-paid job with the business class flights and all the perks. That was the hard bit, and the security, that was the hard bit. Like, surely, I just flow now, I just pivot into what's next. But I couldn't. I just, I, I was just stuck. So I had to continue digging a bit more, questioning even more, 
And I guess I'm still, I'm still doing a little bit of that. During my unravelling, I came to the realisation that British Asians, particularly British Asian women, were born in something of a paradox, were raised in something of a paradox. A British Pakistani friend of mine recently told me that when she was growing up, her dad's advice to her was stay quiet and overachieve. I once got 98% in the science test. I was pretty bloody chuffed, as you can imagine. So I'm racing home to tell my dad. And he sort of looked up from his newspaper and kind of curiously sort of went, what happened to the 2%? And it's, it's not as harsh as it sounds. Well, well, actually it is, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> However, you see, his advice and the advice that other British Asian friends got as well was based on our parents' experience of, and the lessons that they'd learned from growing up, um, sorry, from living a life, building a life in the UK since the 1960s. You have to be twice as good as white people to get the same chances. Margins matter. Every percentage counts. This is a high stakes game. So I, like many of my other Asian friends, walked a tightrope of high professional and academic expectation. You know, it was, it was kind of like, be top of the class, get the top jobs, go to the top universities, fly high, but just under the radar, high performance, but in stealth mode. Because you can't be, you have to be quiet, you can't be too visible. And it wasn't just sort of parental pressure, there's like this self-inflicted pressure that I know other British Asians felt. I don't know if any of you heard, there's a fantastic Nihal Athanaika uh, podcast episode with Elizabeth Day, and he talks about this deep sense of catastrophe. You know, it's like dropping a couple of percent, dropping a few points on a test. It's, it's like, you know, somehow it's insulting to your ancestors and it's insulting to everything that your parents had sort of, you know, the bravery and the risk they took to build a life in this new country. It wasn't failure, it was utter catastrophe. <laughs> Rangan Chatterjee also sort of touches on this. He talks about becoming obsessed with winning, but not winning because he was actually enjoying, you know, the joy of winning. It was just, um, it was just relief, uh, you know, having avoided the shame of failure. You know, you, you see all the, the posters, don't you, like on Instagram, it's like fail fast, fail often. If you're not failing, you're not trying. And I'm like, what? That is just so not what it was like for, for British Asians. Like failure is catastrophe. Failure is game over. And so as I was trying to sort of explore, you know, why am I getting stuck? What's, what else is getting in the way? Okay, so I'm a people-pleasing perfectionist with a fear of failure. Okay, there's, there's that. <laughs> okay, I get that. Um, but there's, there's still some, sort of something else. So I'm kind of reflecting about what I was going through at the time. So when I was a teenager, I was not just, you know, trying to perform, trying to be the good Indian girl, but you're, you're living in Britain, you're being raised in Britain. So you're trying to you know, fit in, you've got the lure of Western culture, you know, you want to look like the girls in Just Seventeen magazine, you want to be like your friends, you know, you're memorising Snoop Dogg lyrics so you can impress the boys, it's just like it's quite a confusing time, but you're doing your best on all fronts, you're doing your best on all fronts. And then, every now and again, you're just, you're going about your business, and then out of nowhere, something just pierces you. It just, it shocks your system to its very core. When I was about 13, I remember going um, to Harrowtown Centre to go shopping with two of my white English friends. As we waited for the lift, a group of white boys came and stood next to us. And one of them sort of nodded in my direction. and said, I'm not getting in the lift with the packy. No one said anything. I, um, I seem to have concluded that if I look down and stare really hard at my shoes, I'm going to be invisible. That was, that was my strategy for it. Um, the doors opened, the boys got in, and my friends and I waited for the next one. It wasn't mentioned. It wasn't mentioned then or ever again. A couple of years later, when I was 15, I was doing work experience at a paper merchant's in Kingsbury. 
And during the two weeks, there was a guy, I don't remember what his name is now, um, but he'd jump up from his desk and say, does anyone want anything from the packy shop? And again, no one said anything. I stared down really hard at my desk because I thought, okay, that's going to make me invisible. There was a woman that sat sort of diagonally opposite me and I remember she kind of made eyes at him as, you know, as if to remind him that I was there. But again, no one said anything. So by this age, I'm learning the rules of the game are overachieve and people please, but stay quiet, stay small, don't be seen. Perhaps that's when I lost my voice. Perhaps that's why I find, I start thinking maybe that's why I'm finding it difficult to move forward. Looking back, I'd say my teenage years, and, and much of the time I spent at university, was like being caught in the centre of a ring. And you can imagine what that's like, can't you? Like, around you, everyone around that ring is telling you what you should look like, what you should be like, what you should do, what you could do. Everyone. You don't know which way to turn. But also saying, don't be seen, don't be heard. Okay, so maybe I'm starting to figure out what's holding me back. Maybe I'm starting to figure out it's all, these, all these stories, all the conditioning, all this baggage, all this trauma. This is what's holding me back. But I've read Gabor Mate, I've listened to Bessel van der Kolk, I'm seeing my coach again, and I'm still stuck. What, what am I supposed to do with all of this? I'm trying hard, I'm working really flipping hard, I'm doing the work, but I'm not, I can't, I'm still stuck. Over the last, over the last few months, it, it started to occur to me that maybe, you know, there's an element of that, what is it, you know, turn that frown upside down, <laughs> kind of the positive reframe. Um, so maybe I need to look at my experience as growing up as a British Asian, my experience of growing up as an immigrant, more positively, see what it's taught me. And actually then I started thinking, maybe it's that very experience that gives me and other immigrants a unique toolkit with which to face the many problems that we face today. So instead of looking at it purely as trauma and you know all this stuff that just needs to be forgotten about and recovered from, you know, important as that is, maybe there's a way to unlock that because we have this unique toolkit within us. So I've started to think about what are some of the traits, what are the characteristics of this immigrant's toolkit? And also think about why they're useful, particularly in this uncertain, volatile world that we face today. Firstly, we're very observational. As a child, I would loved nothing more than, go to, than to go to the shop with my parents. Had the, they ran a convenience store in Harrow. And I used to flip over a milk crate so I could stand and be at the height, the counter height, and get involved in all the conversations. I was quite nosy. And I would always wonder why my mum and dad would talk to English people about the weather. Never talk to Indian people about the weather, never spoke to black people about, about the weather. Always talk to English people about the weather. Why? My dad wasn't remotely interested in football but he made a, made a point of always reading the back pages of the paper so that he could talk to the customers about whose team had won at the weekend. I later realised that my parents were building rapport. You see, my parents had figured out what was important to their English customers, football and the weather, and then, and then made a conscious effort to connect with them, to, to relate to them on what was, to relate with them on what mattered to them, what was important to them. And why is being observational a useful tool in the, in the current times that we face? Well, it means that we can get the lay of the land quickly. We can relate. We can build connections fast. Comedian likes switching from one environment to the next, adapting from one situation to the other. We can assess, react, and pivot quickly. Secondly, we're shock absorbers. 
In the myth of normal, Gabor Mate refers to women as the shock absorbers of society. When I read that, it absolutely hit home with me because that's exactly what I saw my mum and other British Asian women embody when I was growing up. In the mid-80s, my dad was away in India and um, the alarm went off at the shop. The, um, the windows had been smashed in again. So my mum bundled blankets, pillows and her four kids into the back of the car and we drove and went to sleep the night at the shop. I'll never forget waking up in the middle of the night. It was completely dark and there was just like the street lights just, just shining in to illuminate the silhouette of my mum. It was like the back of my mum. Silhouette of her sat bolt upright with a broom in her hand. <laughs> she looked like a superhero. It was like something out of a movie. You can imagine that, right? You know, just, just the street light, just illuminating her. And I was like, whoa. But she had no weapons to hand. She just had a broom to defend herself, her four children, and her business. She cleared away the broken glass. She put us to sleep. And then she had to get on with it. She just had to roll with the punches, had to dust herself off and go again. When I think about the climate crisis, political uncertainty, the volatility of the world we face now, the ability to absorb the shock, to steady the ship, and carry on sailing, albeit course correcting and taking a slightly different direction, is absolutely critical. Thirdly, we create and care deeply about community. My first exposure to this was watching how my parents ran their business. Way before it was trendy to report on your social impact or fudge a purpose and value statement, my parents were serving their community with more than just groceries. I always remember that they would offer to deliver groceries free in the winter for the elderly customers because they didn't want them coming out in the cold and icy conditions. So they'd just say, you know, give us a call, let us know what you need, we'll drop it around, no problem. They cared. At Christmas, they'd hold um, a party, a Christmas party for the customers who had been widowed, because again, they couldn't bear the thought of people, you know, going through that whole Christmas season without seeing anyone, without celebrating. And they'd clear out the warehouse, and they'd put out tables and chairs, and they would um, serve a, a really simple Christmas tea of turkey sandwiches and mince pies and sherry, and um, everyone would leave with a bottle of something, so they had something to open on the day. I sometimes think my parents' approach to business was because of our Sikh background. And um, a central tenet of the Sikh religion is the concept of seva, and it means, um, to, it means selfless service, to constantly be in service of others. There was no trust pilot to put a review on. There were no likes or shares to be had. They just did this because they cared. They cared about their community. And that's exactly what we need right now. We need businesses and business leaders to care about community. That needs to be at the heart of how we approach things. We don't need more top-down solutions. We need to act as communities. We need to listen to community, work in sync with them, and enhance the agency that already exists within our communities. My thoughts on the Immigrants Toolkit, work in progress, <laughs> is um, my thoughts on it are a work in progress, and that's a working title, work in progress, and it's, it's constantly evolving. But I think there are two key themes to it, which I think are important, not just for me, but I think for how we approach things going forward. And the two themes are resilience and self-leadership. My parents were encouraged, my parents and other immigrants were encouraged to come to this country to build a new life. They were sold a dream. They were told that they'd be welcome. But the reality was really different when they got here. They were isolated, they were marginalized. They face violence and discrimination. It wasn't the land of milk and honey at all. So faced with this new reality, they, like other immigrants, had to adapt. They, they had to pivot, they had to adapt. So they worked even harder, they dug even deeper, and in so doing, became masters of the pivot highly resourceful and fiercely resilient. They created their own toolkit, they created their own leadership strategies. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do now.
And the great thing about that realisation that perhaps I've got my own toolkit within me is that I don't need to read another book or do another course, which my coach will be delighted to hear, because the poor guy, just he has the patience of a saint, but, you know, so I just need to read this book and I just need to do that, and, like, he'll be delighted to hear that I finally realised that I don't need to read any more Simon Sinek or Brené Brown. Because <laughs> it's, um, it's inside me. If, we can look in, if I can look inside myself and do the work, it's inside me, like it's inside all of you. When we look back and we can join the dots on our past experiences, we've all got the, the capacity to create our own, our own toolkits and be our own leaders. So where am I now? Well, I'm, I'm still in the mixer. I'm still figuring a lot of this stuff out. But a new, different operating model is, is definitely in the making. Over the, last few, over the last few months, I've been reading, researching, talking to new people, working out where and how I can, I can fit into the climate crisis. I've had to trust the process. I've had to continue working on myself and conti continue working on what I'm passionate about. And I'm, still, I'm learning loads. I'm learning that putting yourself first takes courage and it takes commitment. Some people have referred to what I'm going through as a bit of a, like a self-indulgent midlife crisis, but um, I prefer to call it more of a midlife mashup. So I'm sampling the best bits of who I was and mixing it with all the new things that I'm learning now. I've realized my kids don't need to see me sacrifice myself. They need to see me save myself. They need to see how I save myself. I want to model something different for my kids. I want to model resilience and opportunity. I want them to know that when the shit hits the fan, they can deal with it. They can handle what life throws at them. That they always have options. And finally, I've learned that ripping up the script, ripping up the script that was written for you, it's hard. It's scary, it's bonkers. And, and mainly it's, it's lonely. It can be really lonely. And a lot of you guys in the room are founders, guys and girls in the room. You're, you're founders, so you know what I'm talking about. It gets really lonely on that island by yourself, no one coming to rescue you. Occasionally, a conversation with a friend, an email from a recruiter, a row with your partner, tempts you to take a fleeting glance back to the mainland, back to the safety of the mainland, where you can be with everyone else, be like everyone else. But you get yourself back in the game because you know how much it means to you and it only matters to you, so you have to keep going. Some days I really feel like the fog is clearing and I know exactly where I'm going. And other days, I feel like I'm back in the center of the ring and I can hear the voices of everyone around that ring, plus all the additional voices that I've built up of my own over the years. The voices that say, don't try unless you can definitely get 100%. And you know the loudest, the most incessant, the most irritating voice of them all comes from the center of the ring. And it's me it's me saying, who do you think you are? Who are you to challenge the rules of the game? Have you forgotten how high the stakes are? And to that voice, every day I get, I get a bit better, a bit braver, at saying, I hear you, like I always do. But I'm trying my hand at a new game. And this time, for the first time, I bet on me.